the West, in particular NATO and the U.S., are already at war with Russia. Our leaders just don't know it or are in denial. But there is one who does, Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine. His courage and that of the Ukrainian people have been resounding lauded, yet we still fail to really act. Fearing that we will be drawn into a direct conflict with Russia that will escalate to a nuclear exchange, we have become paralyzed, deluding ourselves that we can avoid a kinetic confrontation altogether through economic sanctions and supply of defensive arms to the Ukrainians. But the power differential is just too great for this strategy to work, and these are just the beginning of Russia's or Putin's ambitions. And the actions are now notably embraced by China meaning we're not dealing with one potential threat, but two. But the real answer is, just as in the time of Neville Chamberlain attempting to placate Hitler, we are already at war. And pretending we can avoid conflict will only serve to encourage Putin to go further. We have effectively adopted a policy of running away when threatened by nuclear war. This gives Putin tremendous power. Why stop in Ukraine? It's already been revealed Moldova is next. What do we do then? Do we again circle the wagons around our NATO allies as Moldova gets invaded, because Putin has repeated his threat to use nukes? And how about Finland or Sweden, or other countries to the east that are not NATO members? And how about when Putin decides to pick off those ex-Soviet bloc countries who have managed to join NATO? Will we again cower at the threat of nuclear retaliation? Putin has paralyzed NATO by simply making a threat, and if he can do that, there is no end to it. Likewise, China is watching closely and learning. If NATO and the United States remain feckless to the carnage that is currently Ukraine, how can we protect Taiwan or any other nation for that matter, in the Pacific or anywhere else? All one needs to do is threaten with nukes. Just like in 1939, when England and France should have said no to the surrender of the Sudetenland, it was a prelude. And we all know now how far Hitler's ambitions extended. The retreat has to stop now. Otherwise, we simply encourage both Russia and China. And yes, there is risk. But, that risk doesn't diminish with continued retreat. Like dealing with any playground bully, it simply increases with every step backward. So what should NATO and the U.S. do? Quit worrying about being provocative, as we are eventually going to have to confront Russia directly, and do what we would do otherwise. Transfer to Ukraine both defensive and offensive arms to take on the Russians, including MiG-29s and Su-25s that are held by NATO members. Poland, Bulgaria, and Slovakia, all operate these aircraft which are staples for the Ukrainian Air Force and would require no additional training to fly. We could incentivize them and reduce the economic burden on these countries by offering to replace some or all these aircraft with used F-16s, which they are all flying and converting their air forces to. Likewise, a former assistant secretary for the Navy has recommended that we transfer three squadrons of A-10 tank busters that we are in the process of decommissioning to Ukraine and that we could do in a few days. Transfer three A-10 aircraft squadrons to Ukraine now, defensenews.com. He believes they could assimilate these planes quickly. If necessary, implement a no-fly zone over western Ukraine and enforce it, and mine Ukraine's harbors in the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov to prevent resupply. This will begin to even the odds. It's not directly an attack on Russia. That interpretation will be up to them and it will be their move. But in short, provide Ukraine the capability that it really needs to even the odds. Not just short-range infantry weapons such as Javelin and Stinger. Effective as they are, they are not enough. Yes, these actions might well draw NATO and the U.S. into a direct conflict with Putin. But, guess what? We're already in it, and we're getting played. He's the one pushing, and we keep backing up. Yes, we are putting economic sanctions on Russia, but how much more carnage must we tolerate before we finally decide to act decisively?
There is no guarantee that Putin will not use nukes, he is unstable, but there never will be. And in the meantime, China is assessing our actions. Right now, they are seeing little courage and mixed resolve. And that must be encouraging. Last fall, Russia began moving troops, tanks and naval vessels to its eastern border with Ukraine and into the Crimean Peninsula, which it had annexed by force in 2014. After initial talks with the United States paused on January 13, the Kremlin apparently launched another cyberattack on Ukrainian ministries and is suspected of placing highly destructive malware called logic bombs in Ukrainian computer networks, waiting to be triggered. As of mid-January, more train convoys with troops, missiles and tanks are moving west through Russia toward Ukraine. Suddenly it seems like Hungary in 1956 all over again. These actions by Russian President Vladimir V. Putin are forcing President Biden and our NATO allies in Europe closer to a historic decision. Should we provide military support, including weapons and troops, to Ukrainian forces? For Catholics in particular, there is another question. Would such support be compatible with just war theory? Russia's aggressive moves against Ukraine began in late 2013, when the Ukrainian president allied with Mr. Putin, Viktor F. Yanukovych, pulled back from joining the European Union and was met with mass protests in Kyiv that drove him from power. Mr. Putin reacted in 2014 by launching massive cyberattacks, sending unmarked troops into the Crimea region of Ukraine, annexing Crimea and fomenting a civil war in Russian-speaking areas of eastern Ukraine that has cost over 14,000 lives. Western nations responded with pinprick economic sanctions, and Germany and France then negotiated the Minsk Protocol which effectively agreed to Russian control of Crimea and half of the Donetsk and Luhansk provinces of Ukraine. Now Mr. Putin wants even more. In addition to the territory he has already taken, he wants all of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions and a guarantee that NATO will never admit Ukraine to the alliance. During U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken's January 21 meeting with the Russian Foreign Minister, Russia upped the ante even further demanding that NATO withdraw all forces from Romania and Bulgaria, which are NATO members. These ultimatums violate just war theory. Rooted in Catholic natural law, just war theory forms the basis of key treaties, including the main documents of international humanitarian law. Six principles are especially relevant in explaining why Russia's actions toward Ukraine are unjust and why NATO's insistence on protecting Ukraine is legitimate according to the same theory. First, just war theory encourages legitimate governments to form alliances for mutual defense against unjust aggression, and NATO is such an alliance. Note that Russia's stated goal is to prevent Ukraine from building its strength through alliances. Unlike preventing an imminent attack by another nation, this is never a just goal in war. Mr. Putin's attempts to stop Ukraine from joining the European Union or NATO are also violations of international law and the United Nations Charter. Second, just war theory allows legitimate governments and their alliances to respond militarily if negotiation fails to reverse unjust aggressions, such as Russia's invasion of Crimea and the eastern half of Ukraine's Luhansk and Donetsk provinces. Third, wars of conquest are all illegal. Russia's desire to control Crimea's ports is a prime example. The victim nation and its allies have just cause to reclaim such losses by force. Fourth, secession is legitimate only as a last resort to end oppression of the seceding region or minority group. Fomenting civil war without such a just cause, as Mr. Putin has done with separatists in eastern Ukraine, is another crime of aggression. Fifth, just war theory tells us that while the need to rescue people from atrocities such as ethnic cleansing can be just grounds for military intervention, the fact that a minority group in a given nation no longer controls the national government cannot be used by another nation as a pretext for rescue.
That was Hitler's pretext for seizing the majority German Sudetenland from Czechoslovakia, and Mr. Putin has employed it in his attempts to control parts of Georgia and eastern Ukraine. Finally, Russia's repeated cyber attacks on Ukraine from 2014 through 2022, which have cost billions and caused collateral damage in other nations, count as military aggression. A proportionate response from NATO to such attacks need not be only cyber. It could include reprisals that destroy equipment and infrastructure. We should remember that although many Ukrainians have cultural connections with Russia, many also remember Soviet control with horror, given the Holodomor, or, terror famine, of 1932-1933, when 4 million Ukrainians died. Ukraine also suffered terribly under German occupation during World War II. After Soviet control ended in 1991-92, Western allies tried to broker a peace that would protect Ukraine from ever being a victim of Russian aggression again. Ukraine, Russia, the United States and the United Kingdom signed the Budapest Memorandum in 1994, by which Ukraine gave up all the nuclear weapons it retained from Soviet days handing them over to Russia to be decommissioned in exchange for promises to respect the independence and sovereignty and the existing borders of Ukraine, to refrain from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of Ukraine, and to refrain from economic coercion designed to subordinate to their own interest the ex-Soviet 